Back in early 2018, the Barbados economy was reported as being in the intensive care unit. There was low economic activity, weak investor confidence, and over-reliance on financing from both the central bank and the national insurance scheme, as well as desperately inadequate foreign reserves. All of these issues saw the then newly sworn in Barbados Labour Party government reaching out to the International Monetary Fund for assistance, which it successfully received. Within the walls of the IMF was a Barbadian, a Barbadian who wanted to help his country. And over the last two and a half years, Dr. Kevin Greenwich has been on loan from the International Financial Institution, working as the senior economic advisor to the government. Dr. Greenwich walks us through some difficult economic waters and explained what happened during that time. Before the BERT program, BERT program came into existence in July, August of 2018. Um, the economic fundamentals had gone out of sync, well, had been totally destroyed. The economy had gone through a 10 year period between 2008 and 2017, just after, which is the period following the global financial crisis. Um, with average growth being negative, you know, whereas the economy did not grow. Between 2008 and two, uh, in 2008, we had a $9 billion economy, right? Nine, $9.5 billion. In 2008, that's the size of the kit that we can, you know, the economic kit that go around to everyone. Prior to that, in 2019, to 1992, when we first went to MF, we had an MF program in 1992, Our economy was $4 billion.5. So it doubled and came to 2008 at $9.5 billion. And then between 2008 9 and 2008 and 2017, the economy had not gone anywhere. We remained a $9.5 billion economy, even a little smaller. So we had stagnated the absolute economic growth. In fact, economic growth for a period average 0.5%. Now, why is that? That is because the response, the first had a shock for the global financial crisis, but then the policy responses were not necessarily appropriate. In other words, government continued to expand a lot of on the current account side um, in terms of, so you saw a ballooning of spending in terms of wages and salaries and transfers going to SOEs, got SOEs, transfers to deal with wages and salaries. So uh, I look at the numbers and can tell you between, two, between 2008 and 2012, Wage and salaries plus transfer increased by at least 25%. On the other hand, the capital expenditure fell by 55, 56%. But capital expenditure is what needs to drive the economy. So I, I, I would have to say at that point in time, there was a, need, there was a, a, a focus on more social spending, I think. But in the crisis, there's not necessarily a correct response. And that response continued. But to finance that with absence of any growth, and you run a fiscal deficit, and a fiscal deficit over that period, 10-year period, so let's focus on 10 years. As of 2017, average 7%. So if you have a 7% primary uh, deficit over that period, you've got to find money from somewhere to finance it, right? And so the debt rose from about 70 to 75% to 179% when the company arrears and everything. 179% of GDP. So let me keep it simple. First problem, you had a fiscal deficit averaging 7%. So that's an, in, that's an unsustainable fiscal position. Two, you had a debt to GDP ratio that went from 70 to 179%. At 179%, Barbados was the third highest indebted country in the world. And that's not something you should be proud of because after Greece and Japan, you're the most indebted. And I, I, I've explained before to people why we say debt to GDP. I suppose it's just debt. And perhaps I could pause and say why. We say debt to GDP, Lisa, because if you have a $10,000 salary, well, let's switch it around more really. You have a $100,000 salary, I have a $10,000 salary. So you are more income than me. And we go to the bank, we both get $9,000 loan. To see who's the most indebted, you can't look because we both got $9,000. But I got more pressure than you. My loan to my income, or my GDP, my income, the GDP economy's income, is 90%. Yours is 9%. So that's why we weight by GDP, so we get a comparative analysis. 179% of GDP. Second problem, right? And if you are spending, and we could talk about another thing, if you are spending, if you are, you are borrowing, borrowing, and your debt is going up, and you're not earning, 
You're not earning anything, even reserves. The reserves will collapse over a period. So over a period, the reserves went from 1.7 or so billion to 420 million at the end of 2017. Hemorrhaging reserves, so no reserves, which means the exchange rate is under pressure. And if, if Barbados don't have any reserves to defend the exchange rate, then it will collapse. And you'd be like, you get, again, for example, back in the 80s and 70s, that sort of environment where you just trade in dollars and Barbados will be unrecognizable. Exchange rate will collapse, so no reserves. Inflated debt, which coupled with the fact that you have a fiscal position on sustainable, you can't pay your bills, and that led to $2 billion in the rears old, right? And you have no growth. And I usually, I mean, this is my term, I refer to them as the four horsemen of the economic apocalypse. These are the four big things you find. Usually one or two, but four together. Is the Reserves are critical in the lifeblood of this economy. You could got all the Belgian money story in a box. You got two billion. And you don't got no foreign reserves, you still can't do nothing because everything you buy is imported. Nobody wants Barbados dollars. They want us dollars. You don't have any reserves to back that two billion or whatever you got, you ain't saying nothing. So reserves are your life dead. So 420 million reserves, you're gonna be in trouble. With debt in the roof, you're in trouble. So I had no choice. You, uh, you have to find a way because they know also come up in July with some debt payments, and then there were all payments. That would be much more than the 420 that was in Kitty. So, and nobody was willing to lend because your position is unsustainable. So, the decision to go to the IMF was one in which you had no choice because this is what that institution was set up for. It was set up to help countries who have what we call external problems. You have no reserves, you have an external problem. Your exchange rate under threat, you have an external problem. You can't pay external creditors because you don't have them. You have an external problem. It was set up for exactly that. And so going to them proactively and at the same time announcing a debt restructuring because if you can't pay your debt, if I were KF Shop or whatever you your bank, two things gonna happen if I'm paying. I am going to them and say, listen, I can't pay you, so let me talk. Or you gonna come to me and say partner you ain't pay for one time, let me talk. But we will talk. So what the government then chose to do was to the first approach, go to the creditors and say, let me talk. Because we can't pay this all bill, let me talk. And therefore the, the decision was one that had to be taken. And we went to the MF. We st we, I came back home and worked with the economic team, a very good economic team. Um, and we designed our homegrown BERT program, Barbies Economic Recovery and Transformation Program. But if you, given your history of not being no fiscal discipline, well, fiscal unsustainability in a, over a period, a period where you escalate debt, a period where you keep borrowing, nobody will take you serious that you will implement a program. And in fact, there have been programs before that have been implemented, right? I tried. So you need some endorsement. That's where the fund comes into place, the IMF. They endorse, which means they went through, they uh, really discussed and agree, and they endorse the program and said, look, but I think they say Barbadians can work with, the authorities are committed to this. And not only that, they put skin in the game, teeth in the game, by saying, well, look, we can put some money to help you get the hole you're in. And because the IMF put skin in the game, so every time we do a review, and why me by review, this is a four-year program. In the BERT program, we set targets for ourselves every quarter that we will meet. Because in a minute, having a program, if I was to do exercising and I want to lose weight, you ain't got targets, right? You can't say, I'm losing weight. How much plan I lose? Ah, I'm too sure. We'll see what happens. No, it doesn't work like that. So you have to have targets. And we have certain targets under our program. I can tell you what I did. Every quarter, the MF will come down and help us look at the targets we set, how close you are to them, what have you passed, where, you, where, you are, where you're going with it. And that's also helping investors regain confidence that we are. Thing. And to date, we have met all. And so, a, a part of that too is say that because they're endorsing confidence, they put money in the game and then us to help us. Because even you know, Chris, you still got, you know, we're going on right now, you still got to feed people, you still got to build back the economy, you still got to do capital work, so still need money. And, and, and so, they put money in the game. And because they put money in the game, people know that this is a credible institution. Other international institutions like the IDB, the World Bank, CAFTA, and them are really now to come and lend money because the IMF is it. So because of that BERT program, right, that we've been working for the last two years prior to COVID, we moved the debt, part of that restructuring and fixing fiscal from 179% to 100 and, 
and 19% parity at March 31st, 2020, which is just when COVID hit, 120%. Now, that is also significant. I shall mention before, you know why that is significant, Lisa? Because at 179% of GDP, the government was paying 67 cents or so on the dollar from every tax in debt service. So every tax dollar they take, they had to pay in debt. We receive 33 cents to do everything. So we all got the intention to limit what you can do as a government because most of your money is going to debt service. So by getting debt down now over two years to 119, we were paying 22 cents on the dollar. It means that you got 88, uh, 78 cents left to do the stuff which you will see in terms of buses and roads and things like that. So it frees up space you'll do something by fixing your debt. It also means when you rate agencies that come and investors will say, well, the debt is not a problem. And once they believe in the macro position, they're more willing to come in and invest in your country. So you saw credit ratings start to go back up. We have 24 downgrades per now we start to go back up. So fixing debt was critical. Also, we spent the time fixing the fiscal. To move your debt down a uh, trajectory, even after reducing it and moving it down, you have to run primary balances, economics, finance, I mean, revenues, money expenditure after you take out interest payments, because them is something you can't control. That is, your debt, that is payments on your debt you had before. Your revenues, man, that it means that your balance, you have to run a surplus to pay down the debt and pay back arrears. And we're looking at 6% primary. And using 6% primary, we're able to pay down debt and pay back arrears. So we pay back arrears. With one one point nine billion at the beginning of COVID, we have paid on to just over hundred million. So that's putting money in the economy to help people do so paying batteries. Um, you give bonds to some cases, you do a little eighty five cents on a dollar. You do what you can do, but you pay on arrears, pay back tax arrears. So that's so you fix it and that's the indication of fiscal is sustainable when you can pay your bills. So you fix this fiscal, you fix the debt. And because of that and the fact that International institutions lend you funds to do what you gotta do, and you earn a little bit here and there. Our reserves went from four hundred twenty million dollars prior to COVID to about two point four or five billion. Right now, people say, "Yeah, that's borrowed." Of course, it's borrowed. some is borrowed. A lot of it borrowed, but you borrow one percent to order to do what you need to do. Every developed country must borrow, but where you borrow, you borrow and trade in the whole thing. When you come pay back, you earn it. But if you borrow, build roads and build infrastructure and invest in different things, you will earn to pay back. So it's important the interest rate. Prior to, prior to the BERT program, because the debt was on subsidy, people were only willing to lend at astronomical rates, like 12 and 13 and 40 percent. No, it's 1 percent. So because of that, we've been able to, you, you fix the fiscal, you fix the debt, you've got like, adequate reserves. And then you start to deal with impediments to growth because you just can't get growth by doing anything at all. In any economic program, whether it's the IMF support or your own homegrown program, growth is the last thing to get. You have to remain, remove impediments to growth. Like we do a lot of reforms at the customs departments to, to, to uh, reduce the time it takes for people to get things over the customs, make things smoother, implement risk based analysis, in, improve the asset cooler system, and do things like that. The revenue authority, you do the large tax payers, you need to do different things. Town country planning, you, you reform the way you do business. So you're really improving the government don't get growth, you know. Government don't get growth. Government creates a conducive environment for the private sector to invest in the economy to grow. When government builds a road, yes, they employ people, but that don't, that's not sustained growth. But when government builds a road and a farmer can get his produce from point A to point B, easy now, now you get growth. Because he can build a farm. How businesses are gonna spread along that that, that road. So people can come and invest and build a building a school. That's how you get growth. Government builds the infrastructure out. Government builds out your water system. Then you get a golf course, build a hotel set up. People think government government not responsible for growing. So government then have to use it, 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 it powers to remove the things that will stop growth. So when somebody going to turn country planning now to get a permit to do something, it doesn't take months. It takes a few days. When they want to start a business, they don't have to go bam, 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 they go one place. So moving those impediments is what, it, what government were, uh, what we were doing at the moment, prior to COVID hit. And we have expected to get, we are hardly declining, growth was, economy was stable, and then you will pick up, right? So that's the picture in a nutshell prior to COVID. Given the horrible financial position that we were in, was devaluation ever at any point in time one of the options on the table? Let me put it this way. 
countries with less fiscal and, 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 and external problems will have been evaluated will have been value already. What made that difference? Well listen, it, so you got look at this way. Let me explain it. So you have a problem, you have a, a hole, you have no reserves, right? You have zero reserves. Well, a bit of reserves. You have no growth, you have no fiscal. Now, there's a economics you say you can adjust through quantity or price. The exchange rate is almost like a price effect. When I devalue exchange rate, it's supposed to make things cheaper. We don't always work over small economies. You can also tackle it from the domestic side or the quantity side. When you fix your fiscal and you put your house in order, you are actually doing things that will encourage growth and, and earn money to protect your exchange rate. The difference really is the willingness of the government, what they want to do. If you cast your money back to 992, right? I was a little baby back then, of course. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. You remember I was working, I was, at that time I was working at Alexander School. I was a teacher at that point in time. And we got a slip saying, do you want 8% or do you want exchange rate dev devaluation? I got a slip asking, that was the choice that you did. And then I think the, then, yeah, I mentioned it, uh, uh, the, the, uh, at that time, the, the unanimous decision was to keep the exchange rate and take a wage cut. Why a wage cut? Because we're going to get, when you cut, you, you have an internal, what you call internal devaluation, which is dealing with the quantities. You reduce your labor, you reduce this and that, you reduce your wage bill that you can afford to live with. If you don't do an internal devaluation, which is really reducing your fiscal and fixing your fiscal, then you got to do what you call an external devaluation, which is moving the exchange rate. So you have two choices. MF don't go into and tell anybody what to do. That is a misnomer. Maybe back in the my grandfather MF, even before 992. Back then, maybe, but it's not that game no more. The MF approach is that countries must own the process. If you go into the gym, Lisa, and you don't own it, but I am forcing you to go, you'll let you to, to be committed in times difficult, right? So countries will say, listen, this is the hole you have. These are the issues, I remember we said, this is the hold you have. These are the issues. You've got an unsustainable debt position. You've got an unsustainable fiscal position. You have no reserve to protect the exchange rate, and you have no economic growth to get anything from. You have choices. Here's a menu of options. You could start to fix your domestic issue, it fix your fiscal, fix your, your debt issues, and move in and permits of growth, and see what you can get. Or you could devalue. Or you could do a mixture too. The, 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 the choice is up to the country and the commitment they have to their reform. In our case, Barbados choose once again to protect the exchange rate and focus the bulk of the reform on fixing the fiscal, fixing the local economy, and remaining committed to that process. Look at your MF as a doctor, right? You go to the doctor, you tell the doctor, well, doctor, you know, um, I got ulcer here. The doctor okay, says a tumor, my dear. Here are your options. You can cut it, I give my medication, reduce it, I can put it, but I give you two options, right? You said, Doc, you see me I'm about that life business right now. I can focus on the maze and try to reduce this myself with exercise and that. The IMF has a duty to, av to advise countries on all the options they have. So they will see a devaluation as option. But early in the game, remember I told you, we, even for, e while the Prime Minister was engaging the IMF in, in discussions about things, we were already working on the work program. And we sat down and worked with the IMF team and ourselves and devised something that did not include devaluation. The question is, is it credible? Can it hold up? And that's what uh, we would have, de have devised. So I think the real thing to us is that whether you want devaluation or not, sometimes in real choice, you know. Let me explain. That's what I was getting. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. In what EMF tell you will do, if you run over the reserves, a devaluation happen whether you want it or not. Because anytime somebody wants to buy something, let's say one buy this phone, this phone says 500 US, I carry $1,000 at Central Bank. And that's a 500 US. They said, no problem, because they got. And they will give me at two to one. But the idea they can't give me at, they don't have enough. They start rationally. Mm -hmm. Even if they want to hold it two to one, mm -hmm. right? I fell down the road and said, partner, because everybody can't get some, right? You can say, a taxi man, you say, boss man, you see me, I can give you three to one or 225. And then I said, they got, they got US, you ask you 250. People start bargaining. And what we call a parallel market can develop for foreign currency. We're having a good central bank, right? Remember, the days we go again, they used to go to change the money in the bank. You go on the market and come with a bag, a white, a bag of money. That's the valuation, right? So if you do not have the reserves to protect your exchange rate, it will devalue you whether you want it or not. 
the key is to develop policies that help you to earn foreign exchange while inv people investing, while earnings that will protect your exchange rate. When you first saw the state of the numbers of Barbados economy, how scared were you? Listen, I used to walk through MF borders and people that said, Kev, I know happened. Boy, Barbados in trouble. It was bad. I mean, how scary it was? I don't know if you get much more scared than that. I mean, we had a 10 year, in my view, a 10 year. Um, it was rough. We had a 10 year um, economic recession. And numbers keep rising and rising. And at the same time, you, I advise other countries and I see what I know on the numbers. So I, I was very concerned. All right, Dr. Greenwich, we're going to look at the Central Bank Governor's Report for 2020 now. Mm -hmm. According to Governor Kevin Haynes, the debt to GDP ratio moved from moved to 144% at the end of December, up from 120%. Under the work program, as I understand it, we're not supposed to incur debt. But of course, with COVID and no real revenue, as well as the need to borrow, this has happened. So, okay, let me just correct you on one thing. On the book program, we can incur debt. What you're not supposed to do is have a net increase. So you're not supposed, debt is supposed to keep coming down every year. Mm -hmm. So if you borrow, just make sure you pay back more than you borrow. You retire debt, you get new, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. So you have ceilings on debt. Um, so let me, let me explain a bit the governor's report. But, but first, I will tell you that every country in the world is increasing debt, yes? Yes, okay. Yeah, I just published a report called the Debt Pandemic. A lot of countries are increasing debt from 120% to 144% is correct. You're correct. But it needs to be explained properly, okay? If you look at the same governor's report on page, that's page 7, uh, it says that um, it, it was... Uh, we took out, we have loans coming in to the tune of 968 million. That's what you say, right? So debt went up by 968 million. At the same time, we pay back $658 million in debt, pay off debt. So the net increase in debt is only $310 million. That's what he says there. So now we move on to early 2020. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think, the worst nightmare for any economy, really, especially a tourism-dependent country like Barbados. The numbers are horrible. Mm -hmm. We have no arrivals to speak of. The lowest on record, I believe. Is now the time to look at diversifying the economy away from tourism? So, so you're absolutely correct. First of all, two things I want to say, and then you get the exact question. First, yes, the you're correct. It's very. One is shot, a shot that no one's ever seen before, us or anyone in the world. And as you, as you governor would have discussed here, they, 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 over the period, actually, COVID period from April to December, he, um, tourism fell by 90%. Uh, something we've never seen. I hear, we estimate the economy contracted by 18% in 2020. Even in the previous recession, 1992, in, and then 9-11, when the Planes flew, in, flew into the tower. We had no tourists. We were in the five and that kind of percent. Nothing. This triple that, quadruple. Four four is the system. Yeah, quadruple. <laughs> so, yes, we can't underestimate, understate the shot. You're absolutely correct. Two things. But following that, we must say we because the work was done in the work program, we were in better position than most countries, even some of our compatriots in the Caribbean, unfortunately, to weather this. That's why the government was able to respond so quickly and try to deal with it. But to your specific question about diversification, um, whether in a crisis or not in a crisis, we should always be looking to broaden the economic base. Now, in my view, remember, I'm just an advisor, I don't make policy here. Eh? In my view, we were always for a while to be a tourism dependent economy. Yes, agriculture did good during the year, and will, I will continue to, to, to make. But the focus, in my view, on agriculture is not because it's a foreign exchange earner. It is because of full security. If anything happens, you've got to be able to feed yourself. I think we focus on, we should focus on continuing for agriculture because of full security. It will earn some foreign exchange, but not like no tourism. I mean, a farmer could work, 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 and two tourists come, and immediately somebody gets 500, 600. You understand? Not to the, but... 
So I'm saying we are not going to abandon, we should not be talking about abandoning tourism. But we think about widening the base into other areas, agriculture, my other manufacturing areas. Like move, the idea to move down the value chain from bulk sugar to direct consumption is a fantastic idea. Moving into other energy sources and production and solar panels. These are brilliant ideas and we should continue to diversify, right? Um, and even within tourism, diversify the product. Streamline the way we do things, make it more efe efficient and smooth, you know? I always remember, for example, you go to Disney World, but Disney World, where the water coming from? The NFC sea around that, but we surround the water and sea, right? So we take, take creatively. We pass through Niagara Falls. Niagara just got a falls, and you see how many, you'd be high priced to pass through and leave them in your pocket, especially if you've got children. So yes, diverse, diversifying the economic base, but don't, tourism, I, when I was growing up, I heard tourism are our business, let's be our part. Tourism will always remain our business in my view. Don't shine at it, you gotta respect it. It earns a lot of 60, almost above 60% of reserves in tourism. We are service dependent on it. We don't have enough land space to be competing in agriculture other countries. But yet, we should focus on food security. That's been a goal. You saw the feed program, uh, new areas coming to cultivation, um, and thinking of different ways of doing different things. That's what helped the agriculture sector to actually produce more than it did in 2019, even in midst of COVID, because of those new things. Focus on manufacturing and what we do, the pharmaceuticals and the, you know, the body parts, I don't know what they call them again. <laughs> the instead, those sort of things. And, uh, 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 um, but you know, you understand. So we do we need to diversify? Which I say that is where we should be looking to invest in anything. But no, make no mistake, diversification should not be used synonymously with the term uh, as being synonymous with uh, replacement. It's not the same. All right, Doctor Greenwich, if you could just explain to us the difference between printing money and borrowing money, and how dangerous is it to print money? That's a very good question, Lisa. And I think it's important to clear up some misconceptions. Some people have seen purse articles represent say there's no difference between printing and borrowing. There's a huge difference between printing money and borrowing money. And the difference has to do in terms of the channel and its impact on the foreign reserves. Okay, explain what I mean by that. So let me get step back. Remember I told you the foreign reserves is of blood lifeblood of this country. You could got all the money in the world in terms of Belgian money. And you can't exchange it for US money or whatever currency you want, well, you are broke. Because everything, almost everything we import and consume, everything we consume is imported. So you need foreign reserves. Okay? Now, when this central bank prints money, and usually government got deposit at central bank, deposit account, and central bank can lend money government, it could withdraw that. So the difference is what we're talking about. When central bank prints money, which means basically lending money to government. People use the concept printing because there's really no economic, there's nothing back in it, right? So that's, if it's central bank, it lends a um, hundred a thousand dollars to government. What government does with that money? It takes a thousand dollars and it pays wages and salaries, the, the workers, public sector workers. It may invest some in the economy in terms of maybe fixing some road or something. It may buy some goods and services like equipment, computers, paper. In other words, government spends a thousand dollars in the economy in my example right what happened let's follow the money follow the money agents the same worker or, or whatever the contractor who got the contract the billy roy the person who provided the service the electrical flow who provide telephone every agent that get piece of this thousand dollars half this money now right what they do with it they must consume they must Bill must do something. The worker got to go to Price Mark and Goddard and wherever and buy food. The man that he, he contract got to pay his workers too. The money gets used. And eventually, people need to spend on imports. Even if you spend on Price Mark, Price Mark still got to import again. If you, if you got real estate, he still got to buy concrete and cement. He still got to spend it. The money get, that thousand dollars is in the economy being spent, right? Eventually, it goes out in imports. But that thousand barbells dollars do not go in imports. 500 Barbados U.S. equivalent has to go in imports, right? 500 U.S. equivalent have to go in imports, which means that those individual persons, let's say one person, they go to the central bank or their commercial bank through the central bank and say, take my 1,000 U.S. Barbados dollars and give me 500 U.S. God want to import fruit. Say so we want to import 
machine rewiring port, clothes, whatever. The point is that thousand dollars that central bank is in government eventually move through the economy, bam, 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 out through imports, but it goes out in foreign currency. How the government, how the central bank is in government, in billion dollars. And how do it go in foreign currency? We usually say it is like a seven five cents on a dollar or eighty cents. It means that every dollar you get, you tend to spend eighty cents, right? But for our example, that's just do dollar for dollar. It means the reserve falls by how much? If you have foreign reserves in your kitty, they will fall by 500. Before the example, central bank take out $1,000, rent to government, government spend in the economy, it go on through all the systems, and eventually it go, and the reserves do so, fall by 1,000, right? Now, that's when you print money. And if you keep doing all that, just printing, 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 one for one almost, or seven five seven dollars, the reserves will keep falling, falling, falling. Right? Between, and let me give you an example of that. Between, before I tell the other channel, we have a real example of that here in Barbados. In 2008, the net credit that government had at the Central Bank, the stock was 285 million. Between 2008 and 2017, that rose to 2.2 2. 2 billion. That means, Government lent, central bank lent government almost two billion dollars in foreign in, in U.S. dollars in Barbados dollars. The same two thousand eight, we have one point six billion dollars in reserves, and that fell down to four hundred. It, 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 it ain't not rocket science. Every time you spend a dollar in Barbados, because of our openness to say economics, we have a high propensity to import. Then, you ain't gonna change that. Okay, small big economy. You don't grow rice. You don't make pasta. It ain't gonna change overnight. Your reserves gonna do so other and fall by your amount, right? And so therefore, that's the danger of printing money. That it impacts the reserves on most dollar on dollar. The alternative now is to borrow. So government still needs to spend a thousand dollars in the economy because they still have to do government's business. The difference is now government decides to borrow from the IMF or borrow from IDB or borrow from CAF at a very small interest rate, say one percent, because you just have to be careful. How much you borrow? That's the trick. Go manage the borrowing. Now the money comes in to the economy, to, to the central bank. So IMF is IMF lines the government five hundred US dollars. Central bank receive the five hundred, convert it to a thousand, put a thousand in gov government deposits, and the five hundred US that it receive, it put in the reserves. So what happened, Lisa? Reserves gone up by five hundred. That's the difference. In the initial stage, the reserve gone up by five hundred. Central bank then lines. We still net credit. Then it's all gives you money for one quite the government. Thousand dollars. Government spend it to the workers, the contractor, the the spend something building some a, a, a road, whatever. That money going into the economy. And just what it spent, it works itself out. It going through the whole process, eventually ends up going to the country in for in, in imports. And to do that, the persons, the individuals, you and I, agents, go to the central bank. Get 500 US, give back the thousand dollars, and the money gone out, and the reserves fall by 500. But what happened before? They went up by 500. They just come back down where they were. So your reserves have a different impact. You see, at the same time, hopefully the things you spent that thousand dollars on will earn you economic return because you can't grow. So when you're ready to pay back that thousand, that five hundred bar at one percent, you can more than afford it. Maybe you build a hotel and you're earning foreign exchange, you can more afford it. Maybe you build a road and people start business and money come in, you can afford to pay back. So it matters what you do with it. But purely on the difference between printing and borrowing, printing have a devastating impact on your reserves. It's something you would you would do. Because just like me and you or a business, a business, government is a business, right? To some degree. Businesses have overdraft account at a commercial bank because cash flows don't always match sometimes the money you expect coming don't come the same you gotta pay and therefore the 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 bank will give you an overdraft but if you keep using overdraft over time then that defeats the purpose similarly central bank will have to give government money but of a temporary nature every now and then and government pay back and pay back to smooth out what we say the fluctuations and the difference between the receipts and pay payment but sustained lending that we have seen in, in historically happen will deplete your foreign reserves 
so that you see by 2017 our foreign reserve 420 million and what happens when you deplete your foreign reserves you lose the exchange rate because it can't protect it so hey, any idea printing is fine you want to do it, do it it comes to a choice though you print and lose lose your foreign, foreign reserves and by extension eventually your, your exchange rate or you take your alternative route manage the economy in a way that you can still gather international commerce that you can borrow money you just gotta do and pay back properly so that big difference they are not the same government raises money through increased taxation is that a likelihood at this time given what the country is going through you know i can't say i can't see anything i am not i don't have a crystal ball but let me tell you from economics pure economics when you're in a recession you don't go raising taxes you can't give me an example of when we were in a recession taxes were, were raised and it helped I think from the last response from response to the last global financial crisis we had a, a number of taxes and you will see they didn't help in the recession one have to focus on stimulating economy and tax doesn't stimulate economy at the beginning of the book program a number of tax reforms have gone in place including the unification of the offshore and domestic tax rates um, Prime Minister and the administration will have reduced the tax bans which effectively lower the tax burden for individuals and persons have more to at home. Once you have done that, that settled, you have to let that settle down and see how your taxes are performing. In a recession, in a crisis, you do not raise taxes. You find spending, you spend what you have to spend on key, so you control your spending by spending effectively on key um, things like capital spending, etc. And if you have to, you run deficits with the understanding that you will fix them once you come out because you're not you haven't you're not committed to any particular recurring expenditure. Well of course I'm an advisor, so but that's if that is a common view among economists who understands how the economy should work. For educational purposes now, let's look at Bert, Boss and Best. I want you to explain each of them for me. <laughs> Bert, Boss and, and Best. Um So BERT, BERT is our BABES Economic Recovery and Transmission Program. BERT is the overarching economic recovery program we have. We have worked on BERT since August 2018. We had two years of working on BERT before the COVID hit us. The objective of BERT were to f fix the fiscal and the debt to make them sus both sustainable in order to restore confidence in the economy and generate inclusive economic growth, right? And we have achieved many gains on BERT by reforming the way we do business. We made a lot of change with the SOEs and with the central government, trimming, fixing. We fix the debt, we fix the fiscal, we pay down your arrears, and we, we're doing it. That's economic, that's BERT. BERT evolves with the situation. So BERT, for example, on the BERT, we were targeting 6% primary balance in order to continue to pay down debt and do other things. And that was because the previous year we also had 6%, we did it. But when COVID hit us, we, re we look at BERT, we change some of the dynamics in BERT, and we wipe and we uh, say, well, let's relax the fiscal position, so we only 3% primary. And then as the pandemic continued to hit us, we continue to slack it in discussion with MF, to one percent, and the pandemic continue to hit us. You can't, we can't predict it, and therefore we widen it to minus one percent. So BERT is evolving. Some people thought BERT is static. BERT is evolving. BERT is the overall umbrella that we work on it. On the BERT, you have to do things on set on sector level to deal with certain issues. So BOSS, which is the Barbados Optional Savings Scheme, came along, and the idea of BOSS um, was to allow us to provide even more fiscal space and financing by paying workers part of their salary in cash and some small portion in bond, which is always to put by that instead of paying that portion in cash by bond, you use that for savings. And month to month, we have had like $4.7 million paid out in bonds. 
uh, private sector workers at the initial offset would have taken about 1.2 billion every month and the other 3.4 or so goes to the central bank on the open market where to me seeing public sector workers and individuals taking it up 4.7 multiplied by 18 is an 18 month program will save us roughly 19 million dollars in terms of additional finance and do what we need to do so that was the purpose of boss under the umbrella of BERT, right? Still on the umbrella of BERT, because BERT is your rash income paradigm that which we all operate within, okay? You know, I say, well, a vision of people perish. This is the vision then. This is the BERT is the big thing. It's best. Barbados employment su uh, sustainable um, transformation. Now, I don't work intimately with BEST, but I can speak to the general idea. Best, best is twofold. It's supposed to, it helps to provide um, an investment opportunity for business and also an employment opportunity. So businesses now, instead of a hotel or any business shutting down shop one time, because the problem with a hotel going to be shutting down because there are not enough people, no tourists coming, means that if you shut down a plant, things deteriorate. You shut down for two, three weeks, the toilet rusts out. Thing for so you have to you should keep your plant running at some minimum and a business that goes out of business it's much more difficult to start this economy will recover Lisa and the question is when so a business got a whole strain hold tight and try to be in a position to take off when the economy opens up and the world comes back right so you don't want to go so if a hotel now could keep some staff on or majority of staff on and pay them something because government subsidizes that payment the 80 percent or whatever because it's subsidy coming from government right in exchange maybe for preference shares they can do that the workers they're in the body in the hotel but they can do things they can train so that they're better able to deliver the service they can they can uh, revamp the business processes more get it more it friendly you can even revamp the premises to make it look more spacious and whatever you do what you need training retooling and reimagining the product it can happen in tourism, it can happen in any other way. So best now by providing the employer, because you ain't got the money, he's cash flow strap, but with some sort of finance and some sort of fund that he now can keep the workers on, pay through best, in exchange for preference share, and he now can they can still do something. You're providing employment, you're providing support to the business. The other arm and best is that it allows him also to say, Well, I have this down thing, let me invest in perhaps putting solar panels all over the um the business, the hotel, or investing in green technology, or doing something which he probably can do with the mainstream and things, right? So the an investment, and the, I think part of it is that is 100%, 20% of whatever they borrow from government to invest will be a grant, something like that. But we are not focusing now on the the numbers. We are focusing more on the um, where the investment, right? Mm. So that's the overarching between best work and boss. And there was one question I couldn't end without asking. <laughs> Who is Dr. Greenish? Um, I'm a Barbadian, um, trained as an economist, worked in the National Monetary Fund, and returned home to help for, the next, for a period of time. Um, I don't know exactly. But when people see you all on the street, do they tell you about it? Yeah, people, people nine out of ten persons would always say to me um doing a good job thanks for offering your service to the country i think people are generally appreciative particularly when Beijing is a Beijing coming home and um and, and trying to help um so yeah i think in general people do express some sort of you know appreciation for it i um i like talking to people i like explaining concepts to people i know person say i speak Right, raw Beijing. I can pretend I can speak proper English, you know, and put an accent. But I think if you go to communication, is that speaking is to communicate to explain, and so that's what I like doing. And I think um, just putting the straight economic facts out there that people derive whatever conclusion maybe, yeah. But I'm a simple kind of guy. I like a, I like to sit down, have a whiskey, and play some dominoes. Um, very simple guy. Okay. <laughs>
As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to have a devastating impact on tourism-dependent countries like Barbados, Dr. Greenwich remains confident of the island's recovery, which hinges at the moment on travel once again returning to pre-COVID levels.